When did you first come in contact with the concept of the Idaho Education Network? Well, I, I had worked on broadband, uh, oh gosh, back 2005, my first year when I was here, and we did a broadband granting program in, in, uh, through appropriations. Um, and the intent was to use the uh, state capital or the uh, state uh, the bundle the state services so it would, would convince uh, commercial to, to put out broadband services into, into more rural communities. So, so the idea of, of taking and using the purchasing, the purchasing needs of the state to, to be an anchor tenant for the development of broadband concept I've been uh, familiar with for many years. What were your first impressions and what did you think this could turn into? Well, I thought this could turn into a, a way to provide uh, broadband telecommunications in many of the uh, rural areas of the state that without the state as the anchor, um, it would be next to impossible to get the capital investment uh, from the telecoms that would be necessary to do it. And walk me through your involvement with the bill during that 2008 session. Oh, um, well, the, the, uh, um, I was uh, really interested a lot in the uh, Connect Kentucky and the Connect USA approach where they aggregated business and then the state was kind of the aggregator and it used that then to pull telecom into it. And so, so I saw the possibility of using the, the state, the county's public service, um, uh, school districts as a way to say, okay, we got this bundle of business that needs servicing. Can you build the telecommunications network out? Um, I had not really thought about using E-rate as a way to help fund that, but you know, it seemed like a reasonable idea at the time. And as it started to roll out and take shape over the next couple years, what did you think? Well, I thought it became very bureaucratic and uh, uh, certainly it became uh, owned by the, uh, I'll say the Republican Party, but basically the, the Republican administration. Um, I think originally the governance had no Democrats on it, and then it eventually added one, Dan, Dan Schmidt. Um, and so um, it just seemed to me that it was just taken over and, and kind of, uh, you know, got away from a, a more, uh, democratic and universal approach. When you saw the IEN in use on the ground in your legislative district, what did you see? Well, I saw um, a way exactly to get broadband access to, to uh, schools. We have some very small school districts, uh, cul-de-sac, for example. We also have Lewiston, which is a fairly sizable. Lewiston could have handled the telecommunications needs um, without a lot of help. I mean, they could have gone out and gotten their E-rate money and gone in contract with the provider. It was very, very difficult for cul-de-sac. Their IT director is also the high school principal. She teaches math and science. And I think that's true about other places in the state. So the, the managed network was a way to help get that out. Now, I, I also believe that uh, it, it would help the businesses in the area, because once you get the information superhighway there, you can drive lots of vehicles over it for economic development, for uh, public service, like I said. Um, so getting it tied down to education was not consistent with what I had thought we could do. One of the things we've been looking at is whether the kids in cul-de-sac who are taking distance learning classes, maybe the two kids who are taking AP Algebra are getting the same quality of education as kids who are taking it in person. And what we're finding is that although everyone's tested, they get, everyone gets a t uh, assessment tests, there's not necessarily collated data on who is doing better and if the kids are retaining the information if they take it over distance learning. What, did that ever come up in conversations? And if it didn't, why not should it have? Well, certainly the, the qualities and capabilities of distance learning are, you know, have to be measured. I mean, we have that in medicine too. Is, does telemedicine give you the same quality results? But I tell you that they wouldn't have had an algebra teacher in cul-de-sac. And, you know, it's 40 minutes into Lewiston and, and so it would take, uh, take a really a lot of a difficulty for that to do that. 
Uh, the time was that people used to board their kids in town to get those kind of, 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 of training. So is it better than nothing? I suspect it is. Is it comparable and exactly? I don't know. I'm not an educator. When did you first realize that something wasn't quite right with the IEN? Um, when um, it was kind of spirited off and hidden behind the wall of the Department of Administration. So even before it ended up in court? Yes. How did you feel at the time? Um, you got to remember that I'm a Democrat in a highly Republican uh, legislature, and I've seen it happen before that, uh, um, you know, you just don't have to consider proving it right or testing or monitoring because you're right. You're just, if you're a big majority, you're just always right. When did you officially hear that there was a problem? Uh, gosh, I don't know. First, uh, I think I, I heard about it from uh, Dan Schmidt and some of the IPREC stuff he was telling me about. And so, should this have ended up in court? No. There are lots of ways that you can correct errors. For one thing, you have to be monitoring and looking for it, and you have to be open to the concept that you can make a mistake. Um, and then you have to give a, a way for people to be able to lodge that concern and have it investigated. If the only place you can go for with that concern is to your boss who's involved in, uh, and the boss above who's involved in, in and has highly invested in the way things are, and is unwilling to hear complaints, well, that's going to make, make it so that nothing really happens. You either swallow your complaint or you move on to a different, to a different job. So I think having a way that people can actually say, hey, wait a minute, that may not be right. We could have identified that contract, what, a year into it if somebody had said, uh, listen to Syringa and say, hey, wait a minute, that wasn't done correctly. Somebody investigates and say, you know, there may have been an issue here. Let's stop. Let's go back and start over. Um, it would be at least one year then instead of four years of, uh, of financial meltdown with E-Rate. And is this a result of corruption or incompetence? I don't know. My guess is it's probably incompetence. And I, I'm, I'm, I may be naive. I tend to give people the benefit of the doubt. It certainly does not, was not due to an overabundance of expertise in, um, in managing contracts. Where does the blame lie? Well, I think the blame lies in, in the Department of Administration, um, the former director, and the current director, but also in the governor. And perhaps some in the legislature. We did not create the kind of oversight that uh, a multi-million dollar, tens of million dollar con a year contract deserves. We have a, and oh by the way, we have a lot of that in state government. School districts have been directed to put together their own contracts to secure their own internet services for the short term while mm -hmm. the state figures things out. Are you concerned that because of the compressed time frame and the high stakes that individual school districts are going to end up in the same situation that the state did by messing something up in the contracting process? Well, I think that that's possible, but first of all, it isn't a five-year contract, it's a four-month contract. Um, I think that uh, the, most of uh, the school districts, and I think in our purchasing rules, that there's an allowance for, I believe it's $25,000, that if it's less than that, an emergency doesn't, doesn't have to go through the formal bid process. So um, I think there probably will be schools that take, the, take their money and say, well, we're going to go out and contract with ENA for the service and CenturyLink for the, broad, for the bandwidth uh, because basically they're the only ones that are connected to us. Um, I think there's others that have uh, multiple vendors that will go out and negotiate some additional bandwidth and not need to go through ENA and, and, and CenturyLink. Uh, and I'm hopeful, and from what I've talked to uh, the uh, uh, Department of Education and their technology people and, and the administration, is they're going to make every effort to make sure not only that they give the financial support for those contracts, but also the technical support. Um, so the high school principal in, in uh, cul-de-sac isn't the one who has to redo the network connections, et cetera. 
You mentioned when we were talking about where the blame lies that some of the blame lies on the legislature as far as how you're looking at things. Looking back, personally, would you have done anything differently? Well, first of all, I think that when you have one, when you don't have somebody, when you don't have a skeptic in your group who says, wait a minute, are you sure that's really the way we should be doing it? Um, that uh, uh, that's a problem. When you don't have a way to take a complaint and have it investigated and escalated, particularly on an IT project, when, uh, that's, a, that's a problem. How could you, with, this, with the kind of blocks that were stacked up behind that, go if you were, uh, say, an IT person in the Department of Administration, go to the director of the Department of Administration or to the governor and get the kind of investigation that, that was needed. I think we need a better, a better way forward uh, to uh, allow our good state employees to protect the assets of the state and the citizens. And speaking of the way forward, what is it? Well, I think that we have to have a short-term contract to get through this school year. It may be that the uh, best way for next year is to uh, also have a sh short-term contract managed by, uh, coordinated by the Department of Education, but this, the contract's done by the individual schools. They would then likely be able to go and apply for E-rate money. The E-rate money helps offset the cost, and that's a good thing. I mean, we all pay it in, in taxes. But it isn't necessary. I mean, we can appropriate, just give one less tax cut, for example. We could have that money to appropriate for, for, for the network. I think eventually, though, we will be best served, uh, particularly in the rural areas, by having the ability to have a managed network, uh, at least in areas where they can't afford or it doesn't make sense to have their own IT staff. So that, in your opinion, is the best way forward. What do you think is actually going to happen? Well, I think that uh, JFAC is pretty well determined. We're going to have the schools and we'll get, give what assistance we can. I don't think we've decided yet about next year. I suspect it will be, again, money to the school districts and helping them get the contracts directly. It is not a contract then between the state of Idaho and whichever vendor, and hopefully the uh, FTC and USAC will uh, treat it more kindly than, uh, than currently we have. But I think eventually we're going to want a, uh, a, a network uh, administration governance uh, for at least the state, whether it's, health, uh, whether it's telehealth uh, networks or um, educational networks or networks that we're trying to develop for economic development. Um, but it has to be uh, people who, who know and people who are open and have the ability if something goes wrong that, that that there's a way to improve the, the, the process and the quality. Um, and we can't be arrogant. I mean, we cannot say that because we're the majority, we know what's going on. Do you think this is going to change the mindset in the State House? I think it will. I think that uh, in the, the short term, that there is uh, going to be a real decrease in confidence in uh, the Department of Administration, not just with this contract, but with others. I think that uh, uh, there will be a skepticism about, um, you know, big projects, um, which may be healthy and may, may not. But the fact is that, that whether you're talking a transportation project or a, a telecommunications project, there are things that state government can do that will improve the lives, health, uh, of Idaho citizens, and we just need to figure out how to do it right. We had purchasing laws if they were followed. If somebody could have said, "Hey, that's not that's not right," or listened to the syringa out short of making them go to court to sue us, you know, I think we'd we'd be way ahead of where we are now. So far, all of the repercussions have been, for the most part, for the teachers and superintendents, and most importantly, the kids. Are we going to see repercussions for? the administration, for lawmakers, for people in the Department of Administration? Well, you know, the uh, repercussions for lawmakers is something that the voters have to do, and they just had an election where the same people were returned to office, basically. So they'll have to think about, is this the way we want the state to be run? As far as the administration, I think there will be repercussions. Certainly there should be accountability uh, to uh, uh, those that uh, really um, 
tried to hide the ball from the uh, from the oversight committees. Uh, didn't listen when when said you know it's it's not a legal contract. You really can't go forward on it. I think that that uh, uh, there probably will be. I'm not sure what they do. What they do. It's not a thing that something that the legislature, and particularly the minority party in the legislature, can do. What do you think those repercussions should look like? Does it involve indictments, or does it involve well, people I, losing their jobs? No, no, that's way beyond. Uh, I, I certainly think there should be uh, uh, a good investigation, and I think we should do it in the manner of quality improvement. You know, it's not like we're never going to have big contracts again or big IT contracts again. And we better figure out how we do it better, how we do it right, so that we don't keep tripping over our own feet. Is this, this past week, is this the worst case scenario, or could it get worse from here? I, oh, I can see it getting worse. How? Uh, I can see it getting worse and that the, the claims for damages are upheld and we have to go and find additional money and take it out of the general fund or other, other face. I can see it getting worse. I don't know what that is. I mean, I'm not, like I said, I'm not on the inside like some people. But yeah, I could see it getting worse. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Uh, no, not this time. Really? Oh. <laughs> Really? <laughs> no, I don't think I can say that. I'm curious, that, like in the parlance of our state, if uh, if you were running Idaho like a business, and you were CEO of Idaho, would you be firing people left and right after this? Well, I don't know that I'd be firing people left and right, but I would have them. Um, I would call them to the desk and say, "What's going on? Why did you do this? Uh, this is the effect. How do we get out of it?" And if I couldn't get it honest explanations, if I couldn't get a way out, yeah, then I'd fire. But stuff happens sometimes. You re advi uh, rely on a lawyer's advice and the advice isn't the way the court dec decides it. But when it keeps coming up and keeps coming up and things get worse and things get worse, you know, um, that's not what you should do. And there are certain best practices in um, IT projects. And I'm not sure that we know how to do that because we get in our own way so many times, whether it's Molina or the uh, school net or the IC or iSIMS. Um, you know, we, we just had, have, have not been, when you said, is it uh, criminal or incompetence? You know, it's, I think it's, it's, it's that we're pretty much incompetent and we don't know that we are. The arrogance, I think, of power oftentimes gets in the way.